Hello, pre-calc kids. This is Mr. Bean. Welcome back to another lesson in AP Pre-Calculus. Today, we're going to look again at more parametric functions, and this time we're going to focus in on rate of change for a parametric function. Okay, it's not too bad. Uh, there's a lot of things we're going to just use the, from skills we did in Algebra 1. Uh, but for, first, we're going to start off with talking about some things of more things on direction of planar motion. Then we'll get into the rate of change stuff. So just as a reminder, we got this parametric function. Just remember that the x of t is modeling the horizontal component and y of t is the vertical component, right? So if we want to know if a function uh, for a parametric function, if the motion is moving left or right, then what we have to look at is the individual components and see if the x of t is increasing or decreasing. And then again with the y of t, is the y of t decreasing, is the y of t increasing? If we know those things, then we can tell what the particle is doing. So here's what it looks like. You just get that if the x values are getting smaller, if they are decreasing, then we know the particle has to be moving left. If the x of t is increasing, vice versa, then it would be moving to the right. And then y of t, if the vertical component is getting smaller, then we know the function is moving down, increasing, moving up. Okay, so kind of common sense there, but we want to make sure we put it into words. And then we need to, uh, oh, and we got to remember that this only is applying if we're increasing in t values, right? The parameter has to be getting larger for us to be able to tell if x of t is increasing, decreasing, y of t increasing, decreasing. Now this little paragraph statement here, this is just to make sure that you know that uh, this part here, that the planar motion, planar motion may be different. So the direction it's headed, up, down, left, right, any of those things are gonna be different for different values of t. So it just kind of depends on what the function looks like. As t changes, you could be going back and forth. In fact, you might even have a line. This is kind of cool, sometimes you have this. You might have a line that goes like that, and then the graph just turns around and comes right back on the exact same line, and then it goes back on the exact same line. Like that's a possibility. So just, it might be, go back and forth on top of itself. It just, as time increases, the direction of the motion can also change. All right, so we're going to look at an example of a circle. Circles, parabolas, those are great examples. So let's look at an example of a circle to show what we're talking about. We will do circles later in unit four. Okay, so this is, don't stress about how to create a circle or anything like that. This I'm, I'm giving this to you. So here's an equation for a parametric equation, f of t equals cosine sine t. I already filled out the whole table, so we don't need to deal with all that. I'll take all the time of that. What, what There is an important sentence in here. We're going to assume that the direction does not change between values of t. So it's going to only change at the values of t. So in between zero and pi over four, the thing x and y are gonna either both be in, or they're gonna be either increasing or decreasing. You know, it's not going to change in between there. That's an important thing because if we didn't have the function and all we had was a table, you can't just assume that from this point to this point that it's just increasing the whole time or decreasing the whole time. Okay, that is important. So this statement, I've included just to make sure that mathematically it works out. We're going to keep these in this lesson really simple. Every time we have a table, we're going to go ahead and just assume that the direction's not changing in between values, okay? So I just want to make that statement real quick so that it's not throwing you off. All right, so the question is, is the particle moving left or right on the interval zero to pi over four? So we're going to look at zero to pi, or pi over two, excuse me, to pi, zero to pi over two. On that interval, is it moving left or right? Well, left or right has to do with x values, right? That's uh, an x value. So we're going to look here at this line and figure out if it's increasing or decreasing. So to get from here to here, what's the what's this? The one value of one to the value of square root of two over two, is that getting smaller or getting larger? You might not know. I mean, if, if you plug it in the calculator, you know, this is actually going to be decreasing. I'm going to put a minus sign just to represent that it's decreasing. And then square root of two, to two, that right there, square root of two to two, is also decreasing. So from zero to pi over two, it is decreasing. That means it is moving left. So the way we make that statement is we say it's moving left because x of t is decreasing on the interval zero to pi over two. So this is the answer is moving left, and this is the justification of how we say, how we know that, because x of t is decreasing. All right, so now the, is the particle moving up or down? Same interval. Uh, in order for it to, to be checking moving up or down, we're going to be looking specifically at the y values here. So then the y values from, this goes from 0 to square root of 2 over 2. Well, that's obviously getting 
larger. So I'll put a little plus symbol there. And then here it's also getting larger. I'll put another plus symbol here. So it's increasing. And if it's increasing, we've got to be moving up. So our statement is moving up because y of t is increasing on that interval zero to pi over two. Right now, I do have some graphs below just to sh show what I was, uh, what I'm doing here, so you can kind of get a feel for it. So this is x of t, x of t from zero to pi over two, right here. That is decreasing; it's going down. So what that means is that from zero to pi over two, the x values are decreasing. Therefore, it must be moving to the left. That's supposed to be an air flat arrow <laughs> moving to the left. Okay, so that's what that's happening from here to here. It is moving left. And then let me change colors here. So sine from zero to pi over two is that function is increasing. Since it's increasing, that means the y component has to be going up. So from here to here, the y component is going up. So yeah, that makes sense. This graph right here has the two components of moving from here, from the left, from, from excuse me, moving left and moving up at the same time. Uh, and because of those two components, we can see what's happening. This part of the lesson is just showing that you can have a curve and have different ways of writing it, right? You can have this parametric curve, but there's not just one, only one way of writing out a parametric function for that. So if we, ha it's, that's different for rectangular equations, right? For a rectangular equation, I mean, if you simplify the rectangular equation, it's the same rectangular equation every time for that curve. You're not gonna have different ones. Now, later on in this unit down here, it says that later on uh, in this unit, unit four, we're going to learn how to par param uh, parametri parametrize, I don't know how to say this word, parametrize a rectangular equation. In other words, we're going to learn how to take a rectangular equation and change it into a parametric equation. So we're not having to do that in this lesson. I just want you to know, understand for this lesson that there's different ways of doing it. Um, so here's an example, though, of what we're looking at. Uh, we're not having to do a lot of a lot of calculations here. We're just going to look at some things that uh, let me highlight t equals one to t equals two. So we're going to start at t uh, negative one. T equals negative one to t equals two. So on that interval, what is the movement doing? So we're going to we're going this direction, right? Let's put some arrows down uh, because the parameter t is increasing that way. So from t equals negative one to t equals two the movement is left and up. We're moving left and up on that interval. And then all of a sudden it changes direction. And now we're gonna go uh, to the right and up on that interval. So from two to four, there's my four right there. On that interval, we're moving right and up. Uh, okay, so pretty simple. That's all I wanted to show you on this one because now I wanna show you that we can create exactly the same graph, but you notice here, t minus two quantity squared and t plus one. This is now going to change to negative at t minus two and one minus t. And then the restricted domain is different. Uh, the graph is identical. It looks exactly the same. The difference is going to be the movement of the particle. So if I go from negative four to negative two, now I'm starting at negative four and going to negative two. And now the graph is, since we're starting there, let me put some arrows on this thing to show that this is the direction we're moving now. We're gonna go down and to the left. Right? Yeah, or left and down, if you want to say it that way. And then we keep going, and we're going to go along this graph, and now we're going down this way. It's turning, and now we're moving off to the right, and we're going down. So we'd say that from negative 2 to a t value of 1, we're going from negative 2 to 1, we get that the graph is going right and down. All right, so the, the point of showing you that is that you have parametric functions that are different, but give you exactly the same curve. And you can just change, and if you change the parameter and change things around, you can actually make the motion go in a different direction. Uh, so that's the next part of our lesson. How can you just take a graph with motion and change the direction? Get the exact same graph, but change the direction. This is how we do that. So let's say you have uh, x of t and y of t. We're going to plug in a negative t. So that's what it is. We negate the input of the parameter. So instead of x of t and y of t, you plug in negative t, to both of to, to all of the t values, and uh, and then you get the direction the opposite direction of motion. But if the, if it's restricted, right? If the parameter is restricted, then we take the interval from a to b, and we have to swap them. You're going to go from b to a instead, and make them negative. So we're going from negative b to negative a. 
All right, that's how we change the direction, get a, get a parametric function like that. So let's, uh, let's do a quick example of this. Here we have a curve. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is the curve parametric equation. And we're starting off here and we're going this way. Okay, so just so you know, that's the direction we're headed uh, for this from negative two to three. So this is starting at t equals, t equals negative two. So if we wanna have exactly the same curve going the other direction, what we do is we take our x of t and instead of t, we say negative t. So then you just plug in a negative t into all the places where you see a t. So negative t squared minus two times negative t, not two t. And then that equals, simplify this out, we just get a positive t squared plus two t. So that's how that x component changes. Now let's do the y. So the y is going to be t squared plus t, but we plug in a negative t. That gives us negative t quantity squared there plus a negative t. And then if we simplify that out, we get t squared minus t. So you can see we've plugged in the t there and there, the negative t, excuse me. So there's our new components of our parametric function. And then we just have to figure out the intervals, right? So it was going from negative two to three. And so now we're gonna say on the interval negative three, less than or equal to t, less than or equal to. And then so we swapped the three and the negative two and changed their sign to a positive two. So if we were to graph this right here, these are the components, the x component, the y component, and then on that interval, you'd get the identical graph, but you'd be going the other direction on this thing. So kind of cool how you do that. All right, last part of our lesson, and then we're all we're wrapped up, we're done here. That is the actual rate of change. So the, the mathematics behind this is pretty simple. The calculations, I should say, is pretty simple. Remember in algebra, even pre-algebra, you learned how to do the slope of a line which is just the rate of change of the line, you would just have that the slope equals change in y over change in x, or you could think of this as y2 minus y1 x2 over x2 minus x1, or you could think of this as rise over run. All the same thing here, right? So what we're going to do is a similar thing for parametrics, but you have to independently find the rate of change for x component and the rate of change for the y component with respect to your time. So we're gonna take two time values. We'll say the first time value and the second time value, the parameter value, I, could, I should probably say. So those parameter values, we use those to find the rate of change for X and then the rate of change for Y. Once you have both of those, then you can find the slope of the line. I'm gonna change this. Your notes will say gives the slope of the, I don't wanna say graph. I know I'm just being technical here. The slope of the line, it's going to be a, a straight line between two points if you connect it. So the slope of the line between the points on the curve corresponding to T1 and T2 would be this thing, the change in Y over change in T. So the rate of change of Y divided by the rate of change of X. So it's still similar to this, how you have change in Y over change in X, but you have to find the individual components first. So each of those functions, you find the slope for those two points for the two T values. And then with that, you divide the two to get the slope of the line on a parametric curve, the slope of the line between two points. All right, is that confusing enough? Watch, it's not that hard. Let's do an example of this. So here we have a function and we've got the X component here and you've got the Y component here. And we're only doing this on the interval of negative three to zero. Let's find, eventually we wanna find the slope of the line between the points, negative three and zero. So we're going from negative three to zero, but we first have to individually find Y of T and X of T. So, uh, Oh, that's supposed to be a zero right there. I will also fix that on your notes. Sorry, negative three to zero. So we're gonna do y of zero minus y of negative three. So then on bottom, if we started with the zero here, we gotta do the zero here minus, and then if we did negative three there, we gotta do the negative three. You can swap them, right? You could do y of negative three first if you wanted, minus y of zero, but then you gotta put them in the same order down here. Okay, then we get equals, What's y of zero? So this is where you might have to do some side work real quick here. Like what is y of zero equal? Well, that's just the square root of nine minus zero. The square root of nine minus zero is going to be three. So then we can say, all right, well then we're gonna have three minus, and now we gotta go, okay, well what's y of negative three? So you might have to do some side work to be able to figure these values out. Nine minus negative three squared is going to be nine and that equals zero. So we have three minus zero on top, and on bottom we have zero plus three. So we have three over three, or just one. 
So the average rate of change for the y component on ne from negative three to zero is one. All right, now let's find the x. So we gotta do x of zero minus x of negative three. We're just doing very basic algebra skills here. Zero minus negative three equals, now this one's a lot simpler because the x is just two times t. So that's just gonna be a zero minus times this one by negative three. So we get a negative six all over three. And then that equals six divided by three is two. All right, so now what do we do from here? The slope of the line between the points from negative three to zero is just the change in y over the change in x component with respect to t. So the average rate of change of y was one and the average rate of change of x was two. And that's it. So that's the slope of the line between the two points that correspond to t equals negative three and t equals zero. All right, this is Mr. Bean signing off. Rock that master check, and I will see you back in our next lesson.